um, I'm Becky Hall from the Nevada Science Center. I'm the Director of Education. Um, thanks, Josh. So here we are, like Josh said, in the muddy mountains of Southern Nevada. So we're about uh, 45 minutes outside of Las Vegas. Um, if, if all of us know where Las Vegas is, especially if we're going to school here, right? Um, but behind us, you can kind of see um, the red rocks behind us. That's the back side of the Valley of Fire State Park. And beyond that is Lake Mead National Recreation Area. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Triassic in Nevada and why right here is important. So right here, we're in uh, pretty much the Mesozoic. So we have the Triassic, the Jurassic, and then beyond those hills, we have the Cretaceous where we find our dinosaur bones. So I'll have you start, well, here. Sure. So we're consulting a book that was written by Kirk Johnson, who's the director of the Smithsonian, and uh, Ray Troll, who's a paleo artist, who did a really great job putting together the geologic time scale. So here, the Mesozoic, this is the age of dinosaurs. And so lots of the famous dinosaurs that we think of like Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops, those come from up here in the Cretaceous or the last period of the age of dinosaurs. Jurassic, like Jurassic Park. And then, but we're gonna go even farther back in time to the Triassic. So the Triassic is the very first period of the age of dinosaurs, which occurs right after the Permian. The Permian is the last period of the, of the era right before the Mesozoic. And why that's important, why we spend a moment on this, is that if we look off to the hills behind us and to the right, those are rocks of Permian age. So we're essentially, like Becky said, standing in the Mesozoic or in the Triassic, but we're right at the very bottom of it. So these are the very first rocks laid down during the age of dinosaurs. If we looked at rocks below us during the Permian, they're full of this rusty rock called chert. Chert forms from little single-celled algae called diatoms, radiolarians. Uh, so these little single-celled organisms make their shells out of opal. And that opal settles to the bottom of the ocean and then reforms itself as chert. Uh, there's also a couple other little uh, fossils in here. There's a crinoid, which is a sea lily in there, which we'll talk more about here in a moment. So the Permian ends with the worst event in the history of life on our planet. So the biggest mass extinction that we've ever had a record of in the history of life occurs. 95% of all life in the oceans goes extinct and does not survive into the Mesozoic. So there was a bunch of weird animals like, uh, am I doing all right? Yeah. Brachiopods. So brachiopods look like clams. They fill the same ecological niche as clams, but they're not even closely related. So they, they kind of evolved the same body shape uh, to fill the same ecological roles. So during this mass extinction, we all think about um, the big asteroid during the end of the Cretaceous that killed off the dinosaurs. We're talking the biggest mass extinction of Earth's history. So 95% of uh, marine life, like Josh said, and 75% of terrestrial life or land life. So that's why Jurassic is so important because it basically clears the plate for all these animals to, to come into existence, right? So life on Earth completely kind of switches over with a whole new bunch of life forms. So then, so Josh shows you the brachiopods, a few of those survived, but more comes like the clams. So should we show them the clams? Sure. That's a good one. Here, you can show them that one. All right, so here's a clam right here. And we have a whole bunch of little ones in here. But this is Triassic, uh, Triassic. Triassic limestone. So we have even more. So we can also find these out here, which is kind of cool, right? So you're hiking along and you find a seashell in the middle of the desert. That doesn't make sense. But did you know that these are about 240 million years old? So the great dying event or the mass extinction event happened 250 million years ago. And then slowly the earth recovered. We have similar animals, but they're a little bit different. So right now we're talking a little bit about the marine animals. So here's some more of those clams. Let's see, anything else? You wanna talk about trace fossils? 
Sure. So the Triassic after the big mass extinction is kind of a recovery story for the Earth and Earth's ecosystems. And some of the earliest indicators that we had life bouncing back from this horrible mass extinction are these weird little marks that are in the rock. These marks are called trace fossils. So this is where an animal dug through the mud, eating its lunch or eating its dinner, like maybe some of you are getting ready to do uh, before lunch break. Uh, but they leave these marks in the dirt that get fossilized as trace fossils. So that's what's happening in the ocean. So the oceans are changing and so are the land animals. So really, really cool back in, uh, was it 2018? 2018, 2018, I was fortunate enough in Lake Mead National Recreation Area to find some of those first uh, animals trackways. So I found fossils of footprints in these muddy mud flats off the ocean or off the coast of this ancient ocean. So as they were looking for maybe clams or small fish in the water, they were stepping on this wet mud and leaving footprints. I don't have any footprints here of those, uh, those animals, but I do have some horseshoe crabs. So it's kind of hard to see. I hope we can see these get close. These little dots, I know they don't look like much, but those are horseshoe crab footprints and there's two on each side so here's a set and a, and a second set is on this side so these horseshoe crabs were walking around these uh, in these tides too horseshoe crabs made it through the permian mass extinction event so there's only a few animals that made it through and these were one of them some of the vertebrate animals that were running around here are kind of the precursor precursors to dinosaurs so we have um like crocodile animals, little like therapsids running around um, these tidal flats looking for food. So these are significant because they've never been found in Nevada before up until a few years ago. So this is one of our research that we're doing at the Nevada Science Center. And besides the, the land animals here that are represented in trackways, we also have a place called Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. And I'll let Josh talk about that. Sure. So Nevada State Fossil, and for those of you who aren't from the U.S., Nevada is one state to the east of California, so we're kind of on the west coast a little bit. Uh, our state fossil is the ichthyosaur, which means fish lizard. So Becky's got a little stuffy of a, an ichthyosaur here. So they kind of look like a fish, they're built like a fish, but they're actually a reptile. So in Nevada, during the Triassic period, we're right on the coast. And so the tracks that Becky just showed you, which she found a couple of years ago down here, were right on the tides. If you go north of Las Vegas, you go up into central Nevada, northern Nevada, that was a shallow tropical sea during this period of time, which supported lots of animals like ammonites. Ammonites are relatives of, if you know what a chambered nautilus is, or a distant cousin of a squid. Uh, so there would have been little tentacles coming out of the front of the shell. Uh, these were probably, these actually have been shown to be the favorite food of ichthyosaurs. And so cruising around our shallow tropical seaways of central Nevada, where there's now mountains and sagebrush and pinion pines and juniper, were big shallow seas full of these essentially swimming calamari and eating them were great big pods, to use the modern term for a group of whales, of ichthyosaurs. And so these ichthyosaurs died up at Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. They built a big enclosure around the deathbed. And uh, you, you can go visit those to this day. Nevada State Parks does a great job of maintaining uh, the big fossil house up there. And it's a great campground, too, for anyone who, who's visiting the state of Nevada from elsewhere or any locals, too. So ichthyosaurs, the ones here in Nevada, were like the largest ones in the world that's ever been found. So they're, what, up to 50 feet long? Mm -hmm. So up to 50 feet long. But today, these kind of look like animals that we could possibly see in the ocean today. So these were a marine reptile, so they weren't fish. So they still had to come up to the, to the air to, or to the surface to breathe. Um, they gave life birth. Um, but they also, they look like animals, right? So their features um, are, are similar to like whales and dolphins today. So it's kind of cool. And that's just another example of life coming up with the same solution to a similar problem. So when land animals go back to sea like whales or like reptiles, 
They get flippers, they get long beaks that makes them help, helps them adapt to their life in the oceans. So as paleontologists, not only is it cool to find fossils, but part of our job is to understand the environment so we can put those fossils into some type of story, right? So prehistoric story. So that's what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out what happened on earth, what, ha what life was like before us. So the rocks can tell us a whole, that whole story. So we talked about, you know, the tidal flats. We know we have to be close to the ocean. We talked about marine fossils. So we have to know we have to be in the ocean, right? So limestone. So coming back, we have also, we have ripples. Well, oh, where's my ripples? Oh, here's my ripples. Right. So more, yeah, you can hold that one. So we have ripples. They have the light to hit it perfect. So this, you, you can tell that we're on a beach, right? Or we're on shallow marine. So without, there's, a, there's water influencing that. So this is almost like sediment fossils. <laughs> so it, it, they're called sedimentary structures, and these are ripples. So it tells us what the, what the environment was like standing here 240 million years ago. I had a, another here. Here's an example. Oh, look, there's a, there's a fossil. There's a shell in there. I don't know. I'll hold it still so you can see it. Right? But this shell wasn't part. This wasn't um, in the ocean. This kind of washed down. So this was in a, like a, a stream or a river. Um, this was another part of the, uh, another piece of the Triassic um, that would have had rivers and more of a swampy area influencing the environment. And we also find on land, whew, look how big this is. This is a big piece of petrified wood or fossilized wood. So we have minerals replace the wood. So it still looks like wood. So the minerals replace the organic material and we have a rock now. So uh, petrified wood can also tell us about the environment was like, what was growing there, maybe how the animals were was living amongst their environment, what they were eating, like that. So the petrified wood comes from a little bit younger rocks called the Chin Li Formation. Uh, that's the same formation if you go over to Arizona, where Petrified Forest National Park is found. So the same rocks come all the way this far west from northern Arizona. What that represents is we're seeing a transition if we're in central Nevada from shallow tropical seas to here in southern Nevada where we have mostly tidal flats. And if we go a little bit farther inland, we're starting to get the swamps. And so petrified forest is the swamp deposits. And here in Nevada, some research that we're doing through the Nevada Science Center is that we're describing some animals that lived in those swamps too. So we have found pieces of giant amphibians, which are kind of relics from the Permian uh, with vertebra this big around, which tells us that that's an amphibian that was probably at least 10 feet long. And what is, what's an amphibian? What's a frog or a salamander-like animal doing that's that big? Well, they're probably filling the same ecological niche as crocodiles. So being ambush predators and doing um, things that crocodile, we expect crocodiles to do today. The Chin Li is also an, in, an interesting period of time because we actually have real dinosaurs running around. Uh, versus those dinosaur precursors, which Becky just talked about during earlier in the Triassic. So dinosaurs, weird crocodile-like things, doing crocodile-like things. So being semi-aquatic, there were some crocodiles which were purely terrestrial, built like pit bulls running across this landscape. So if you think crocodiles are scary enough, think of a pit bull crocodile. Uh, so just weird things during the Triassic. Um, what else? So right now, like I said, we're right on the back side of the Valley of Fire State Park for anyone who has been local or maybe been to, out to the state. But I wanted to, um, so me and Josh go out and we find fossils, right? Whether it be a shell or a trackway or even a dinosaur bone. Um, and we want to encourage through the Nevada Science Center too, besides learning about our state of Nevada, we want everyone to go out and explore themselves, right? So go out and try to find a shell. If you find a Let's say you do find a dinosaur bone or a track. That's awesome. So here we're on uh, BLM land or Bureau of Land Management. So it's public land, just like a state park or a national uh, park would be uh, all of our lands. So when we go to these places, we make sure that we go back and uh, report back what we find. So if you want to be a citizen scientist, you can do the same. So if you're out and you're uh, looking for fossils or maybe even cool rocks, um, you can always report those back too. 
you can contact us or your local park or um, interpretive center. Go ahead. It's, it's important, but the work that we do, we do under permit. And so we have to get permission from the land management agencies to conduct our research. So it's illegal to collect any sort of vertebrate fossils off of public lands. So what Becky was saying about reporting, what reporting means is take a picture in a GPS coordinate, don't touch it. If you pick it up, it already loses a bunch of its scientific value. Uh, but that being said, it's because of people out in the hills and exploring and doing science and just recreating that we find a lot of our stuff because there's, all, there's so many rocks in the state. I mean, if you look in the background, that's a lifetime of rocks behind us. There's no way we can cover the whole state if it's not for people out there with eyes on the ground. Right. So just kind of, a, you made me remember something. So kind of just like a fun story about my Triassic trackways that I'm researching right now is they were first kind of sort of discovered in 1928. So a scientist out here had, uh, did a huge geologic study and said, oh, I came across some trackways. But he didn't tell us where he found them or he didn't report on the trackways because he was more interested in the geology of the of this region. So it's me and Josh have been trying to re, you know, kind of go through his steps to find these trackways again. And we've been really successful. So it's kind of cool being geologists and paleontologists here in the state of Nevada because there's so many rocks here and really unexplored rocks. So once again, encourage everyone. You can be a citizen scientist. You can be a paleontologist. You don't need anything. You just need your boots, your eyes. Um, you know, go out and start looking at rocks. And with that, um, I think we'll shoot it back to Ralph. Ralph, we'll start taking some questions. Yeah, um, absolutely. And while Josh and Becky from the Nevada Science Center, while they get their microphones all set up, feel free to message your questions in the chat feature, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can during the allotted time. Again, we hope everyone is healthy and happy and safe wherever you're at in the world. Uh, I know that we have students as far east as Italy and students as far west as um, San Diego. Uh, Josh and Becky, can you guys hear me? We're good. Can you hear us? All right. Yes, we can. Uh, St. Catherine Drexel Academy says hello. Um, they messaged that to us. Uh, I believe they're in, they're in California. Um, so we have uh, some student questions. Some of them I'll read. Some of them I'll, I'll unmute the students. Um, but our first question comes to us from Mev in Italy. And Mev, you had an awesome question. You should be able to unmute to ask. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Becky and Josh. <laughs> Um, I would like to know if have you ever found something uh, you don't know what it was and that still today doesn't have a specific identity? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that just because I found something last week. <laughs> really nice weather here and I went out to a local mountain and I was looking for trilobites. So trilobites are uh, a lot older than the rocks we were into. They're about 500 million years old. Um, they're little animals that are invertebrates that lived at the bottom of the ocean, if you don't know what they were, uh, they are. Um, and I was out there kind of just enjoying the day, and I was looking for trilobites, bites, and I came across the oddest little, it's so tiny too, it doesn't even have to be something big. This little fossil, I put it on our social media, if you want to check out our social media, and it had... Um, I couldn't tell what it was. So we actually posted it on our social media, maybe to get a response. And we sent it out to a couple of our colleague uh, researchers who do more of that research during that time period. And hopefully we'll figure it out what it is, but we get stuff all the time. And besides that, we also find dinosaur bones that we don't know which dinosaur they came from. So we have to go back um, and research and look in our, in our books to kind of, we compare bones. So a lot of, um, paleontology is comparing it right so if you compare it to what's already found and if you are if you do find something brand new then it's your job as a paleontologist to write a description of it so if someone finds it again they have something to correlate it with that's a, a great answer. We have a question from right here at Pinecrest Horizon uh, here in Nevada, and this is from Mrs. Nudie's class, and they want to know, what is the very first fossil each of you found in your careers? So the very first fossil I found in my career is that there's some chalk quarries outside of my hometown of Fallon, uh, halfway between Fallon and Reno, so uh, up in northern Nevada. And in those chalk quarries, you can go up there and, or diatomaceous earth quarries, you can go up there and 
pull apart the rocks and there's little fish that are about 12, 15 million years old. So I was collecting those when I was probably in elementary school, middle school. And for me, I'll have to say it again, uh, it's probably a trilobite. So trilobites um, are cool for a couple reasons. I'm not a big Cambrian person, um, but trilobites are old, for five, oh, half a billion years old. So that's kind of fascinating to find life a half a billion years ago. And second of all, you can, you can collect them. So it's not eagle, illegal to collect trilobites. Um, so if you find a trilobite, you can bring it home with you. And if you are looking at the right rocks, they're really easy to find or easier to find. Um, so for me, is living in Southern Nevada, going to Frenchman Mountain. So Frenchman Mountain is the same type of rocks that you find at the Grand Canyon. And it's just on the east side of our valley. If anyone is, you know, it's Frenchman Mountain, Sunrise Mountain. And you can go out there on a nice day and look at um, some of the rocks out there and you can find trilobites. And what's the other one, the trilobite Oak Creek? Oak Spring. Oak Spring. So if anyone's in Nevada, um, heading out towards Caliente, Nevada, which is um, on the central east side of Nevada, um, it's called Oak Spring Trilobite Site, another BLM managed trilo uh, area where you can, you're encouraged to go out and find trilobites. So for me, it's a trilobite. Um, but I will always remember the first dinosaur I discovered. That, that is exciting stuff. And uh, happy birthday. We have a future paleontologist over at McCall Elementary School uh, whose teacher just messaged us. So we said, happy dino birthday. I don't know happy if there's birthday. a paleon. Yeah, they're just happy birthday. Um, so we have a question at one of our sister campuses here, also here in Nevada at another Pinecrest. Mrs. Wheeler's class would like to know, what is the biggest fossil that you guys have ever found? So the biggest fossil that we've found as a team uh, working with the Nevada Science Center is actually still in the ground. We're still digging it up. Uh, it was found uh, just outside of Eureka, Nevada, which is along US 50. So kind of smack dab in the middle of the state geographically, out in the middle of nowhere. So we were out there doing some research and prospecting. And as you do, uh, the way we do it is if we look for fossils on the ground and we find the fossils and we just kind of track them uphill until we don't find any more of them. So we did that. That's kind of the routine when you find something new. And we found something, we found where it was coming out. We started uncovering it. It got bigger and bigger and all of a sudden we needed a new type of permit. We have different types of permits for different things that we do as paleontologists. So we're still actively digging this thing up. So, uh, But it's a dinosaur. To be determined how <laughs> what it is and how big it is though. Right, so it's most likely a dinosaur because we're looking at Cretaceous rocks. We just don't know what type of dinosaur or even what part of the body it is because it's just, it's really, really it's big. big. So another, another thing that we have to think about is logistics. So this thing is so big and it's out in the middle of nowhere that it's a two mile hike in. How do we get something that big out? So we've talked about maybe horses. horses. <laughs> so maybe we'll have, there's lots of farms and ranches up there. So maybe we'll ask some ranchers for some horse help. <laughs> well, that that's actually along the lines of, we have a question from a uh, uh, class in, in San Diego. They wanted to know, what is the furthest you guys have ever gone to find a fossil? So the furthest we've gone, so the focus of our research group is mostly sticking around the state of Nevada. So the farthest we've gone, uh, we've got, there's 17 counties in the state of Nevada and we're working in 14 of them. So that kind of tells you that we're kind of all over the place in the state and it's a big state. So I would say our farthest drives for digs are about five hours. Six hours. Six hours. Yeah. So. We also plan our field work around, because Nevada is so, you know, from Southern Nevada where we have, we're in the Mojave and it's very hot in the summer, where we can go up to, uh, um, you know, the north or the west side and higher elevations where it's a little bit cooler. So our field work really depends on the type of year and the weather. So sometimes like up in Northern Nevada, there's snow on the ground. So we can't go look for your fossils up there. So it's a perfect time to be in Southern California. In the summer, it is hot. So being in summer in Southern California during the summer trying to do field work is not fun. So um, yeah, we're all, we basically stick to Nevada. Nevada is our home state. It's our home. Um, we're lucky enough, or I don't know if it's lucky or not, but Nevada kind of has been untouched. So we every time we go to somewhere, it's almost something new. So we're always finding new stuff. So if you're 
want to be a paleontologist? Come to Nevada. We could use some help. <laughs> there you go. You heard it. You heard it there for, first, folks. Uh, so we have uh, a number of students at a number of schools. They want to know what kind of tools do you guys use in your job? That's a good question. Uh, so usually we bring a couple tools out just for show and tell, but we didn't today. Uh, the tools that we use aren't all that dissimilar probably from your parents' toolbox or your toolbox out in your garage or out in your shop or something like that. So we use screwdrivers, uh, dental picks, paint brushes, toothbrushes. Because these fossils are oftentimes softer than the rocks they're in, we have to be really delicate with them. We also have special types of glues that we apply to them that hold them together and stabilize them uh, for going and living the rest of their lives in a museum somewhere nice and cushy. Uh, it's only really rare that we have to dig out shovels or picks or, I've only been on one dig in my entire career where we've had to use something mechanical like and it was a concrete saw, but that's actually really rare. Most of the time we're using hand tools. Yeah, and so we usually carry our tools on our backs. So probably our most important tool is our packs. So get a good comfy pack, um, enough to hold a big water bladder in there or a bottle. And uh, we shove our paintbrushes, little picks and stuff in there. Um, and it's if we have to excavate or if it's something large we come across, then we have to kind of regroup and do logistics about it anyways. But yes, that's mostly our, all of our tools fit in our backpacks. That is, there's a, there's a lot going on. <laughs> With that, uh, some of the students here in Nevada, they want to know, um, where can they safely look for fossils? Like, are there certain public parks that they can, or is it, I know that you had mentioned about that if they find a fossil, don't touch it, just mark the GPS, take a photo and send it. Could you kind of touch on that? Like, how does that affect um, the, the science behind it if humans were to touch that? So there's, uh, it's, there's two parts to that. First of all, are there safe, fun places you can collect fossils? Most definitely. So like we were talking about before, I'll talk a little bit about what you can collect and then Josh will kind of talk to about um, what you can't collect but can safely report and then be a part of. So the, what you can collect, if you are um, on BLM land or a public land, not a national park or not a state park, State parks and national parks, you can't collect anything, not even a rock that looks cool, right? Because those are all there to be preserved. But public land like BLM land, um, you can collect some rocks that are legal to collect. And what are the legal ones? A cool rock that's not a fossil, completely legal to collect. Um, a shell, right? So we have marine rocks, which is called limestone here in Southern Nevada. So you can find those limestones up at Frenchman Mountain, pretty much all the mountains that surround the valley. So Frenchman Mountain, Mount Charleston. So Mount Charleston, if you go hiking up there, look at the ground, you'll find corals, you'll find shells. And we're always open. If you collect those, you can start your own rock collection. We encourage those. We, all, we have had rock collections since we were younger. Um, and then you can even email us, hey, what is this? Or do you know what kind of rock this is? We're more than happy if we can identify it in a picture to help you out and get you started. And then Josh will talk about a little bit about what you should be careful about reporting and not collecting. Right, so yeah, like Becky said, you can collect invertebrate fossils. So those are animals without backbones. As long as you don't plan to sell or trade them to somebody else off of public lands, things you cannot collect are vertebrate bones or teeth. So those are things like uh, Nevada has lots of Ice Age fossils, lots of uh, what's called Miocene fossils, so about 15 million year old range, lots of camel bones, mam mammoth bones, mastodon bones, really cool animals that are littered across almost every single valley in the state. Don't touch them. Uh, it's illegal to pick up a vertebrate fossil without permission from the land management agency. So if you do come across something like that, or even a track fossil in the ground, take a picture of it. Everyone's phones have GPS on them now. Take a picture of GPS. You can send it to us at the Science Center, or you can send it to your local uh, BLM field office, and they'd be happy to follow up with you. If you make a discovery, oftentimes we're more than happy to keep you involved in it. And you can be part of that process. It's actually really fun and really cool. And you get to do science as well. Yeah, so we definitely encourage reporting it because we want to include people who find their, the fossils here. We just want 
um, Nevada to have a better record of what we have here. It's kind of weak right now, but we have a lot of rocks. That means we have a lot of fossils. Uh, very good. And we'll go with uh, one more school question. One of, the, one of the classes would like to know, can you guys tell us what is limestone? Sure. So limestone, which makes up almost every single mountain range in the state of Nevada in some capacity is Don't look at the rusty stuff, just the gray stuff. So limestone is made out of the microscopic shells of algae. So as algae make their shells out of the mineral called calcite, which uh, is just like a little white mineral. And as those animals died over the hundreds of millions of years and their little shells settled to the bottom of the ocean, they accumulate and get squished into this rock limestone. So limestone is just the accumulation of hundreds, if not thousands of millions of little tiny shells of plankton that have lived in the ancient oceans and have turned to rock. So it's marine rock. Um, it's usually gray. It's really rough, so kind of sharp. Um, and you can find the shell, the shell fossils in it too. Yeah, if you're hiking in any mountain range across the state and you see this gray nondescript rock, Take a close look, you'll probably find some cool stuff in it. Or how scientists do it is we pour a little acid on it, right? And it will bubble. So how can you do that? Bring a little vial of uh, vinegar out with you hiking. So get a little container of vinegar. Pour a little bit of vinegar on a rock. If it bubbles up, that's limestone. Wow. You learn something new every day. I had no idea about that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, before we let you go, is there any advice that uh, you guys could give for any of our future paleontologists, how could they follow down your career path and, and go into paleontology like you guys went into? Can I start? Sure. Uh, so I have an interest, right? <laughs> so if you're really interested in to do it, I encourage you to do it, right? Don't be discouraged not to follow something you really, really are passionate about. So we're both very passionate about it. Um, so once you have the passion, um, it's easier to follow the route there, right? So a lot of, it is a lot of science based. So biology, we both studied biology. We both studied geology. So biology is the study of life and geology is the study of rocks, right? So we're studying life in rocks. So it's a lot of geology, biology. We also had to take math classes, um, different other science classes like chemistry. So we're talking about limestone. There's, you know, everything is made up of, So there are, like when you're in elementary school, so read, do well in your classes when you're in high school, start taking a little bit more uh, um, science-based approach when you have your electives that you can pick, that you can pick from. And then in, in college, you know, pick a course of either biology or geology or both. If you want to continue into college. Sure. So one of the most important things you can do is if you have a passion about paleontology or any field for that matter, read about it. So, I mean, when I was a kid or even in early college, I had to go to the library to read. It's all at your fingertips now. So read, read, read about the subject that you're passionate about. And then once you're in college or you're even in high school, go volunteer at a local museum, go volunteer at a local science center, uh, get experience, make sure it's something you actually enjoy. And while you're doing that, if it really is something that ignites your passion, ignites your uh, imagination to do, uh, find a mentor. So somebody that will foster that, that passion and help you take the steps you need to take to become a professional.